All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the NHD Virtual National Contest. My name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the Director of Programs and I'm here in what we're now calling NHD World Headquarters, which is really our offices in College Park, Maryland. Um, we know that this has been a heck of a year. We are so proud to be hosting the NHD National Contest virtually. I can tell you it's not nearly as much fun without the students and teachers and parents and family members and button trading and meals at the diner or stamp student union. Uh, but I can tell you that we have been working with judges all over the world who have been evaluating and working on your projects. We're converting from first round into finals round, working on special prizes and working on those outstanding affiliate awards. It's an awful lot and it's not nearly as much fun without the real people here. But I know that this year in all the challenges of COVID-19, our performance students had a real tough ride. And I know that you couldn't turn in those videos for nationals and I wish I could have seen a lot of them too. So when we started talking about programming, we knew that we wanted to do something specifically focused on performance to help our performance students. And while the team at the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. stepped up and said that they would love to work with us. And I'll be honest, I call your museum the mothership. It's one of my favorite places in Washington, D.C. Yay. So <laughs> before awesome. I turn things over to Julie Gardner and Fiona Marr to talk about what they do at the museum and to talk about all kinds of things performance, I want to mention that we want this to be interactive. Students, we want you asking questions and we're going to kind of sort them out in different ways. We might answer you directly in the chat box. We might, if it's a good question, answer it and blast it to everybody to see. And we might save some of them to ask, answer live at the end. So Julie may answer ones that are more specifically about performance or the resources of the Smithsonian. And I'll be happy to take any NHD questions. So you, at any point in time, go into that question and answer box and then go ahead and just put your question in. We might not get to it immediately, but we'll get to as many as we can. And we always look over the chat history at the end and make sure if there's anybody maybe we missed or we need to get you a more detailed answer. We'll get it to you, we'll send it to you. Please keep in mind, students, digital citizenship is important. We wanna hear your thoughts, we wanna hear your ideas, but it is a webinar platform. So when you type things in, it is recorded, it's connected to your name, it's connected to your email. Just make smart decisions when we're talking in the digital world. We want to leave really good records and have a really good opportunity and program today. All right, I'm going to step back now and introduce Julie Gardner and Fiona Marr from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And they're going to talk about performances and strategies. And I'm hoping that you're going to walk away from this program not only feeling good about what you did this year, but even more excited to tackle your 2021 Communication and History, the Key to Understanding projects. So I'll step back. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Fiona. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. All right, everyone. We are so excited to talk to you today. I personally I'm very sad I didn't know about National History Day when I was a student because I 100% would have been doing a performance. So very jealous of you all. Um, I'm very excited to talk about it more today. Uh, all right, let's get into it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, as tell Liz- us a, Tell us about the museum, Fiona. <laughs> yes, uh, as Lynn said, we work at the National Museum of American History where we have a super big task. Our mission is to empower people to create a just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexity of our past. And that's like the whole past of the whole country and kind of like the whole world too, because when you think about how global our nation is, how global the world is, you can really talk about anything at our museum. And so our department is the one that focuses on education. So that's both in classrooms, but also in the museum every day. And Julie and I, we get to share history, the complexity of our past with our visitors every day in the museum. And our team uh, decided that our goal would be to get people talking to one another. Um, a lot of museum and educational research basically shows that when people get to talk about things, when they get to discuss their new information or difficult topics, they learn a lot better, they remember things better, and they just have a better time doing it. Uh, so we apply that to the museum. Uh, I think a lot of us instinctually sort of know that, right? You usually have more fun or remember something better when you're doing a group activity or doing a debate in class rather than just lecture after lecture after lecture. So uh, when we're in the museum, 
we really want to get people doing what we call civil discourse. We want them to have productive conversations that are very informed uh, by history, by uh, research. And uh, so we get to, we try to get them to talk about some kind of difficult topics in a very civil and calm, informed way. We talk about racism and sexism, poverty, enslavement, all of these issues that we're all facing together. And by doing that, that's how we hope to create that just and compassionate future. And so the way Julie and I do that is through museum theater programs. So I want to just give everybody a little bit of a, a background on our theater programs at the National Museum of American History. Um, the name of our theater program series is History Alive, because we make history come alive. So some examples of programs that we've had in the past, um, we've got Joseph Henry, he's the first secretary of the Smithsonian. We have a series called Time Trials in which the audience debates as to whether or not a person should be remembered, whether their legacy should be remembered as good or bad. Um, and one of those characters, uh, historical figures would be John Brown, the abolitionist. And uh, the debate is whether or not uh, he should have used violence in order to try and end slavery. Um, up here in the upper right hand corner, we've got Mary Young Pickersgill. And she's the woman who sewed the Star Spangled Banner, which was the flag that inspired the Star Spangled Banner, the song uh, that is now our national anthem. Um, so these three people were real people. Um, and uh, this one down here is um, from a program called Letters Home, which is a series of dramatizations based on real letters written by real soldiers during wartime. So they weren't famous people, but they were definitely people who were uh, going through the, the, the moment. Um, we also have another time trials character, uh, Benedict Arnold. People debate whether or not he was a patriot or a traitor. And uh, down here in the far right corner, we've got uh, Nat Love, an African-American cowboy hero. Um, and more recently, Oh, look, there's a familiar face. Um, our programs that are currently running are rather will when we go back into the museum. Uh, up here in the far left corner, we have Votes for Women about the 1917 uh, silent sentinel protests outside the White House. And that would be the program in the video that you were sent. So just to give you some context. Uh, down here, we have uh, a show called Justice Must Be Done in which uh, we we are participating in an anti-slavery society meeting and understanding the little things that people are able to do in order to solve a big complicated problem. In the middle here, we've got uh, the wheel woman uh, and uh, she gets to ride her bicycle around the museum, coolest job ever. And uh, she talks about the bicycle boom of the 1890s and how the invention of the bicycle allowed women to get out and about for the first time. So they had their own mode of transportation and uh, that led to a sense of uh, freedom and mobility. Uh, up here in the far right corner, we've got a show called Shout. Um, and this is an interactive song and dance show that is about the songs that enslaved people would sing and uh, to communicate to one another and also to buoy their own spirits. And we draw the connections between the melodies and the rhythms of the songs of enslaved people and modern day music. So uh, we have drawn lots of musical inspiration from those songs. And down here in the far uh, right corner, we've got Join the Student Sit-Ins, which is our longest running theater program. And it's about the Greensboro lunch counter where the student sit-ins took place with the original Greensboro Four and uh, then spread across the country as more and more people joined the civil rights movement uh, in order to try and end segregation. So we've, got, we've had a lot of different theater programs happening. That's just an, to give you an idea of some of the ideas that we have had. Um, so all of this, uh, where do we start, Fiona? Well, before, before we uh, go into further into anything we do, we want to point out a couple of the differences between the work that we do at the museum and the work that you all do when you're preparing a National History Day uh, performance. So 
one of the bigger ones is uh, interactivity. We were talking about um, how we want to get people talking in the museum. So a big part of all of our programs is interaction with our audience. So we ask visitors to um, answer questions or just sing with us or dance with us. And that's something that you don't do. You don't, you can't have the judges or the audience at National History Day um, interact with you. But don't forget you have, you can have other actors interacting. Usually it's Julie by herself. So she has to talk to the visitors. She has to talk to somebody. Um, so you, you know, you just do that on the stage. Uh, along with that is improvisation because visitors can say anything they want to. We have to be ready to say anything back to them to answer their questions and their comments. So Julie kind of has a choose your own adventure script. So visitor says this, I say this. Oh, now they've said this, go back up here. Um, Yours will be scripted and a little more structured. Um, but again, you might have to improvise if someone forgets a line, if your music stops working. Actors always have to be prepared, right? And we can talk a little bit more about that with Julie later if you guys would like. Um, another difference is your audience. We have an idea of who comes into the museum. We see a lot of students, a lot of families, um, some international visitors. You'll know who your audience is. They're the judges. Um, maybe you know your teachers your your classmates uh and you also have sort of a list of what what the audience wants to see right you have the submission rules you have the theme so you kind of have a leg up you can really gear your performance to your audience uh, but of course there's a lot that's really similar too we all care a lot about historical accuracy right all of the work we do and the work you'll do is grounded in historical research uh, the shows that we do and your performances are similar in that they're not the length of a full play. Uh, you get 10 minutes. We usually do anywhere between five and 25 minutes. So you have to kind of get to your point pretty quickly, but still make it interesting and engaging along the way. And finally, we all have a purpose. We all have a goal. We're not just kind of playing around, even though that's fun. But in, in this case, in our museum and in your performance submissions, um, we have a point we want to make, a story we want to tell, somewhere where we're going to. So, Julie, what advice can you give our viewers about creating a piece for National History Day? Oh, I'm so glad <laughs> you asked that question. Um, I'm going to share a screen here. Uh, my first piece of advice to you all is to take notes. Um, I would say that about 75% of my brilliant ideas uh, get lost because I don't write them down, because I don't have those ideas. Um, they happen at random times. So if I write them down, then I can come back to them. Uh, fortunately, uh, of the 25% of the ideas that I do write down, uh, some of them actually come to fruition and turn into theater programs. And sometimes I look at my notes from years ago and go, hey, that was a really great idea. I totally forgot about that. Maybe now I have the time and the resources to, to do that idea. So if you don't already have a piece of paper um, and pen to, or a device to take notes on, go ahead and take something out right now because I wanna put some pen to paper so that you have a place to start when it comes time for deciding uh, what it is that you're going to do for National History Day. Um, so you won't need to share your answer, so it's okay if it's messy, as long as it's honest. This is sort of a conversation with yourself. Um, the first thoughts that come to your mind, so let's get honest. So pen to paper, here's the question. Instead of submitting in some other category like writing an essay or creating a display, why are you thinking about choosing the performance category? Why do you want to do it? What's your objective? Go ahead and scribble some thoughts down. Trying to get to the heart of your motivations. So if we were to take a survey of all the little notes that all hundred some of you have written down, we might see quite a variety of answers. Uh, we might, uh, your objective for doing this project might be um, to um, educate. Maybe there's a particular topic that you want more people to know about and you want to raise some awareness about it. Maybe you want to impress someone, whether it's your teacher or the judges or someone you like, I don't know, um, but uh, maybe you want to impress someone. Maybe you want to flex your acting muscles. You really want to be on stage. You don't know what you want it to be about, but you know that you want to be on stage. And that's uh, a totally legitimate objective. 
maybe you really like the competitive part of National History Day and you will win. Uh, maybe that's what gets you all excited and motivated. Uh, maybe you have a desire to create something, to express yourself artistically. Uh, that might be a motivation. Maybe you want to do something fun with your friends and classmates. You want to connect with them in working on the project. And maybe you also want to connect with other students not from your school at National History Day um, and, and make connections that way too. And of course, your objective might be to satisfy a class assignment. And that's totally cool as well. Although I would recommend that if that is your objective, that you find a secondary objective because it's gonna make the process a lot more fun and uh, it's gonna uh, motivate you to dig deeper. I find in my work at the museum, going back to the, uh, the mission of our museum that uh, Fiona shared before, which is like an objective, it's the thing that we want to do. When I remind myself that my programs are intended to help people understand the past so they can, um, so they can help people learn about the past, so they can understand what's happening in the present, and they can take action to make a better future tomorrow. So I always reconnect to that mission, that purpose, that objective, and that helps to guide the creation of the theater programs. Um, so uh, Fiona, um, what, uh, what would you say is uh, something that theater can do in the museum that um, exhibits and research articles, I don't wanna say they can't do, but something that theater does a little bit better than yeah. exhibit research articles? Does a little bit differently, right? Um, well, I think a huge piece of it is empathy. We talk about that a lot at our, at our work. Um, so empathy, is a tool that we all have and we all can use and practice, but it's basically a way to better understand other people's experiences. Um, you know, you don't have to walk in someone's shoes to understand if they're going through pain or joy or celebration um, or difficulties. So theater lets you empathize with characters from history. So you can kind of see them come to life and understand their experiences much better than you might if you just looked at something they wore. That's one okay. way. <laughs> or read their autobiography or biography. Right. Um, you're seeing it right there in, yeah. in front of you, bringing history to life. And uh, so I would add on to that, that uh, theater, whether it's in the museum or wherever it happens to be, it really gets to the heart and soul of humanity and helps us to see the things that we all have in common with one another that we might not see on the surface. Um, and theater, it, it inspires emotion. It makes you feel something. And hopefully that emotion and the knowledge within the theater programs uh, will help people to take action as they leave the museum to make that better tomorrow um, so we can create a better future. Um, so I like to think that I am saving the world with my acting. That gives me a sense of purpose. Yes, <laughs> I, think, I think we are. <laughs> so if we want to create a performance for National History Day, where should we start? For 2021, what do we do? 2021, gosh, there's so much to say about this. And I think that there are, are a lot of similarities about um, the structure and the form of what it is that you're <clears throat> doing for your National History Day project that's gonna be similar for all the categories. So because we do have a limited amount of time, um, let's focus on the things that are special and specific about the performance submission. Um, so I'm going to try and keep it nice and simple and break it down into two categories. Where do I start? Um, and the two categories would be form and content. Form is the structure of your piece. Now, we already have some ideas about what the form is because you've chosen that category. The form is a dramatic piece, a piece of theater, a performance. Um, and then there's content. What is it about? So we're going to start to talk about that content. Um, so the content uh, is what it's about, but gosh, I don't know what my project is going to be about. Where do I start? The good news is there's a lot of different places you can start. Um, here are five places that we have started in developing our programs. So perhaps you have a goal. Now this goal may be completely unrelated to any content, but it's identifying your passion and your curiosity. And that is what might help you find the content that you're going to be um, you know, presenting on. So maybe your goal is, I want to work with my friend Sally. 
Maybe your goal is, I want to sing a song. I don't know what it's going to be about, but I want to sing a song. So what is the content that is going to be appropriate for singing a song? Um, maybe I want to play a famous person. Well, which famous person? Hmm? I don't know. Um, maybe, uh, or maybe your goal is, I need to write this before my deadline. Um, so be honest with yourself about what your goal is, and that might be a good starting point. Um, another place you can start is with a theme. So, um, gosh, what is Fiona, like, what is um, monopolizing our news cycle right now in 2020? Oh. I don't know, protests, maybe. <laughs> protests, yeah. yeah, it's kind of hard to um, not see, hear, or be part of that conversation. Yeah. Particularly, uh, we're in Washington, D.C., where we have protests pretty much every single day. There's always somebody uh, who is exercising their First Amendment right of freedom of speech, assembly, and petition uh, to get their voice heard here in Washington, D.C. So if we, uh, oh, look at that, I happen to have a picture of exactly what you just said. Um, can, you, can you see this all right? Yes. Um, so here's, here's a photograph of uh, the most recent protests in Washington, D.C., revolving around uh, the protests um, over the death of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Um, and you can see there's a lot of people standing outside the White House right here. Um, this was in my neighborhood, and it's hard for me not to, hard for me to ignore. So maybe I start thinking about this theme. I want to do something about the power of protest through history. And maybe I think to myself, well, gosh, I wonder, I wonder when the first protest was, or more specifically, when was the first White House protest? When was the first time that people stood outside the White House and with signs and um, protested for their rights? And uh, well, I can find the answer to that. And it, it would be that it would be the uh, 1917 silent sentinel protests outside the White House, which happens to be the theme, uh, the event that is the basis for the Votes for Women program in the video that you were sent. Um, women would stand outside the White House with these banners um, and they did it silently. And uh, there certainly wasn't nearly as many people in the Silent Sentinel protest as there were in uh, the protests in DC recently, um, but it was the first one. And how has that affected protest through history? Um, so we might be able to start with an event that we want to do our project on. Um, the next thing that maybe you wanna start with is a character. So maybe, um, you're like, okay, well, I want to play someone in this um, suffrage movement, a character, a prominent person. So that might be Alice Paul. She was the leader of the National Women's Party in 1917. And she actually was doing these protests. She got arrested. She went to prison. She started a hunger strike and she got force fed three times a day in the psychiatric ward, perhaps because courage in women is often misdiagnosed as insanity. Now, she was a very fierce leader, so that's a possibility. I could play that character. Um, or maybe I wanna play a more ordinary person, maybe someone who wasn't as brave and fierce as Alice Paul, maybe someone who was a little nervous about joining a Silent Sentinels, and maybe I don't want it to be based on a particular person, but rather the general experience. And ultimately, that is what we ended up doing. Um, is creating a composite character uh, who we could draw inspiration from lots of little stories, uh, but we didn't have to just stick to one person's biography. Um, so deciding about what the character is going to be is an important step. And since we are uh, in, the, in the, uh, the, the world of the museum, objects play an important role for us because our museums are filled with artifacts. And so maybe we find an artifact that we want to highlight, such as this little pin right here, Votes for Women, um, which suffragists would wear to help raise awareness and spread the word. Um, and ultimately in our program, what we ended up doing was making replica buttons and we hand them out to visitors as a souvenir, which they really uh, appreciate. So you could start from any of these places in order to create a program um, or create a theater piece for National History Day. And wherever you happen to start, then you can fill out the rest of the categories as you really narrow down to whatever specific topic you're going to present on um, in your allotted 10 minutes. Um, so that is uh, the content 
of what's it about, and then we have the form. Now, there's lots of uh, form specifications for all the categories, so we're going to talk about the ones that are really just specific to theater. Now, if you uh, have the luxury of having a theater class in your high school or middle school, um, you probably already know about the fourth wall. It's a theater concept. So if you imagine that you're standing on stage and you're in a room, um, you've got a wall to the side, a wall to the back, a wall to the side, and a wall in front of you. Now, obviously, if the audience is watching you, they can see through that fourth wall. And so as you're deciding the form of your piece, you and um, your partners, if you are working with a group, can talk about what you wanna do with the fourth wall. And some options would be for you to have a fourth wall um, in a dramatized event, for example. So maybe your performance is really two people having a conversation. If I would have selected Alice Paul as my person, maybe um, I would wanna dramatize the conversation between her and Ida B. Wells as they debated whether or not black suffragists should be able to walk in a parade with white suffragists and uh, instead of marching in the back of the parade. So that would have been a really heated conversation and debate. And that conversation happened in 1913, for those of you that are curious. Um, so if I was having a conversation with another character, we have no idea that there's, a, that there's an audience at this wall who's watching us. Instead, we are just having this private moment with each other. So that would be using the fourth wall. You can get, a, get rid of the fourth wall altogether and do what's called direct address, which means that the performer, the, whether it's a character or a narrator, they know that the audience is there and they're talking to them the whole time, talking right to the audience, storytelling, that would be direct address as well. Um, and then the third one is sort of a mix of the two. It's called an aside, which means that maybe you're having this conversation and one character knows that there's an audience out there and can look directly at the audience and then come back into the scene. So you don't have to pick one of these. Um, you can mix them up if you like, uh, but it's a good thing to know about the options that you have. Are you going to know that the audience is there? Or rather, are the characters going to know that the audience is there? Um, another thing to talk about with form in the uh, performance category would be what kind of language are you using? If you're writing an essay, you're going to use academic language, but when we put it on stage, things change a little bit. So how are you using language? Maybe it's spoken, like dialogue. Uh, maybe it is song, so it's lyrics, and maybe it is uh, maybe it's visual. Maybe you're using signs. Maybe you're using mm, interpretive dance as your language. Um, all of that works as well. If, of course, it's appropriate for the um, for the category that you have, not the category, the content and the topic that you have chosen. Um, so there's lots of different ways that we can use language. So if we're talking about language, historical language, we also need to talk about uh, the style of language and whether or not you're going to be using modern language or period language. So um, period language means that it is of the time. It's, uh, so if I was doing my program uh, and it's set in 1917, how did people talk differently in 1917 than they do now in 2020? So um, one of the options uh, that you could do real quick, you could watch movies uh, that are set in that time period. Now there's a little caveat because uh, you, that means you have to trust that whoever made the movie did their due diligence <laughs> and did their research to make sure that it is of the time. Um, but it might be a good place to start, probably not to end. You probably still need to do some more work. Um, you can also read books from, that were written in the time once again, another caveat is that uh, just because it's in a book doesn't mean that that's the way that your everyday person spoke. For example, if you read Shakespeare, uh, people didn't speak that way. It's not really representative of uh, the, the breadth of language that uh, people in the Renaissance had. Um, it's, um, it's, it's Shakespeare being very poetic. Um, and then you can also use the internet. We have all sorts of resources that we can use. However, with all of those options, Fiona, what would you say is the best place to find the language? Primary sources. Yeah, primary <laughs> sources. Um, this is a big one for us in the museum world because that is where the information comes from. Everything else is just an interpretation. So what is a primary source? It's something that actually came from that time. Um, 
So here's an example of how I used a primary source in order to write the Votes for Women program. Um, this image here to the left is an actual flyer that suffragists would uh, print and distribute in order to try to convince people that women deserved the right to vote. And uh, you can see at the top, it says, votes for women, a woman's reason, because. And if you look down the side, the left-hand side, you see because, 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 because. And um, perhaps that was the inspiration for The Wizard of Oz, too. Who knows? Um, but uh, the because is a repetition. Ooh, I like that. Now, I can't just read this as my script. It's so long, and there's a lot of reasons, and it's very wordy. So maybe I only wanna use a piece of it. Um, so here's the first three lines, because I know it's uh, very uh, difficult to read the actual graphics, so I've typed them out for you. Um, the first three lines are read, because women must obey the laws just as men do, they should vote equally with men. Because women pay taxes just as men do, thus supporting the government, they should vote equally with men. Because women suffer from bad government, just as men do, they should vote equally with men. There's a great repetition there. They should vote equally with men. <sighs> but it's such a mouthful. Um, I wonder if I can make it a little bit shorter. But basically, we've got three reasons that uh, women should be able to vote. Because they obey laws, they pay taxes, and they also suffer from bad government. Um, OK, all right, I'm thinking. Got the rule of threes. Um, what about the last couple of lines? What does that tell us? Oops. Uh, the last two lines. Because women, and this is straight from the, uh, the flyer, because women are citizens of a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and women are people, they should vote equally with men. Equal suffrage for men and women. Ooh, I like that. I like the fact that they're pointing out that women are citizens of this government. Citizens should be able to vote and of the people, by the people, for the people. Oh, I like that. I want to keep that. It's got a ring. And uh, women are people. That's a, that's a really interesting point. What am I going to do with that? They should vote equally for men. Equal suffrage for men and women. Oh, it's all in capital letters. It sounds like that's the thing that you want people to shout. But that's a mouthful. Equal suffrage for men and women. Equal suffrage for men and women. Oh, Ooh, what does it say at the top? It says votes for women. Votes for women, votes for women. I like that a little bit better. Okay, so I'm gonna take the first three arguments and I'm gonna take the end. I'm gonna use some of the same words, but I'm gonna make it a little bit more dramatic. Um, so Fiona, would you like to play a little scene with me? I would love to. Okay, so this is the end of the Votes for Women show and Fiona is the audience. Uh, imagine I've got uh, anywhere between 20 and 100 people standing in front of me and when I get to the end, I, will, uh, I, I point to a specific woman and I ask her a question and then I point to another woman and I ask her a question. So Fiona, you're going to play all those women. Sound good? Amazing. Yes. Okay, great. And my goal at the end of the show is to get the entire crowd screaming, votes for women. That's my goal. Okay. All right, here we go. Ma'am, do you pay taxes? Yeah. Women pay taxes just as men do. They should vote just as men do. Ma'am, do you obey laws? Yes. Women obey laws just as men do. They should vote just as men do. Ma'am, do you suffer from bad government? <laughs> yes. Women suffer from bad government just as men do. They should vote just as men do. Women are citizens of a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Women are people. Not because she's a mother, not because she's a wife, but because she's a person, an American citizen under the law. And that is the reason, the only reason that we need to prove that women deserve an equal voice in our government. Let me hear aloud, votes for women. Votes for women. Votes for women. Votes for women. <laughs> <laughs> so that is how I took a primary source and turned it into uh, part of my performance. Um, so what else do we have here? Let's see here. Um, language, language, language. Also, um, depending upon the slang of the time. So for example, I was trying to think of something that, uh, what would uh, my character say if something was really great? Uh, she might say, it's the bee's knees. I've heard that before. 
That seems like an old timey thing to say. Um, but then I went on to Merriam Webster, uh, which is a dictionary website on the internet, and they told me that it was first found in print in 1921. Huh. That's not going to work because she wouldn't have said that in 1921. But it also showed me a lot of other syn synonyms for that's really great um, for other years. And I found this one. It's a humdinger. And that one was from 1896. So that one is something that my character might actually say. Um, I also used uh, images as inspiration. Here's a picture of, I think it's Mabel Vernon that I found, and she's on a soapbox and she's surrounded by what looks like mostly men. And she's got this look on her face. It's a little cheeky, it's a little sassy, like she's using humor to get to her point across. And that's what inspired um, the use of my language in my show. But uh, what about the other way around? What are some things that we might say about Mabel Vernon in this picture? She's extra. That's what the kids are saying nowadays. But uh, in 1917, they'd probably say, I'm extra what? That doesn't make any sense. What else let me say about Mabel Vernon in this picture? She's fierce. Well, no, they were silent protesters. They were not angry or aggressive at all that word means something different right now in 2020. Or you might say, look at all, look at all those people in the crowd. They're really throwing some shade. That's not what that meant in 1917. In fact, they would have said, nope, we had to stand out in the sun. So keep in mind how uh, modern day language can also uh, work against you. Um, so Fiona, mm -hmm. um, what uh, I think we can probably go to our question and answer yeah, section. We have some um, awesome questions. Oh, we already have questions. Yes, lots okay. of really good ones. So you ready? Yeah, I'm gonna unshare this. Sure. Um, okay. Well, first, I think we might just want to get this one out of the way. A couple people have asked about our backgrounds, how we kind of got to these jobs. So I think we Great. can kind of get that. Do you want to um, go first? Out of the way. Yeah, sure. So I. Um, have like a bunch of combinations of things that helped me get this job but I you know was a theater kid in in middle and high school um and just have always like really loved theater studied English in college like English literature so I have you know writing skills communication skills um and then I interned at the museum and got a job doing this and then was like hey actually I like theater so it was a, a weird you know wiggling my way in sort of path <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, I was a little timid when I was in middle school and high school, um, but I still had this itch to perform, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. I was definitely a musician, um, but, uh, you know, and I, I tried out for the musical and I got in because everybody got in and uh, not at my school <laughs> it just was a little more competitive than mine um, but I was I was in the chorus and I was really tall so I was standing in the back and um, you know I just once once I started to get you know a couple years like by junior year it was like oh you have to audition for the lead and I was like oh I can't do that I can't do that I'm so nervous um, so instead I was in the pit orchestra um, but then I got to college and uh, when I was um, when I would talk with my friends I was very you know gregarious and you know silly like I am right now um, and they're like you should go to an improv workshop and I was like what's improv and they're like uh, just go and I was like okay so I went to this improv workshop um, and uh, probably more people know what it is now um, the the art of making it up as you go along but uh, <clears throat> many decades ago it wasn't as much in the uh, public consciousness so I went and they were playing these games and they were really fun and I just had a great time Turns out it was an audition. So um, I made the improv team all of a sudden. Um, and uh, I we kind of was on this path. To, I wanted to do puppetry. I was like, oh, I can perform without actually having my face being seen. Um, but basically, that path led me to train to be a drama teacher. And I did run a drama program at a high school for quite a few years. And, uh, and then I took some time off to uh, pursue my own acting career because I had never actually done that. Um, long story short, people started casting me, started getting paid, and um, I, now, I now teach at the conservatory where I took my classes. And uh, back in 2012, I saw a post on Facebook um, from some friend of a friend of a friend, and um, it said, uh, oh, the National Museum of American History is looking to cast a role. And I was like, that sounds like fun. 
boop, 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 and I set my stuff off. And uh, that was the Mary Pickers Guild show, The Star Spangled Banner. And it was already developed. They just needed a replacement actor. So I stepped in and uh, did that show. And, um, and then another opportunity came up and I was able to write the, my, the show myself. And that was Meet the Wheel Woman. And so that just kept on rolling. And so this j particular job is the perfect combination of uh, education, which is what I studied, of improv, which is where I started off, and acting, which is my training. So um, the thing that I'm currently working at is being a historian, because um, I need to know the facts about everything if I'm going to make sure that the dialogue that I have with the visitor is based in historical accuracy. Um, so in addition to doing this, uh, I've been in plays and movies and, and uh, not the big screen ones because I never really wanted to be famous, uh, still kind of shy, um, but uh, and also commercials and industrials and I, I do improv professionally still. So um, that is, uh, that's my story. It's a great story. <laughs> Basically, if you feel timid now in middle school and element and, and uh, high school, like you can do it. You can totally do it. It takes work and dedication and a lot of self-discipline. Um, but um, I don't know, it lit a fire in me. And uh, now I'm using my talents to uh, educate and entertain. Yeah. Yeah. It feels very cool to be able to use theater, which I started doing probably because I was like, I love costumes and I want to look pretty up there. <laughs> and now we get to like teach people things with it. It's a very cool uh, field we're in. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What All other right. questions do we have? Yes. In? So here's a, a kind of big question. A couple people asked this. I'm sort of trying to combine this, yeah. um, but it's about composite characters versus historical figures, which you talked about. But can we go a little more into sort of when you would choose one of those and why? And also, um, someone had a very interesting question, which I'm not sure I have an answer to. Um, how do you deal with performing a real person while creating your own character, basically giving a real person a unique personality? How, how, do you, how can you deal with that? You've been Mary Pickerskill, who was a real person, so maybe you can answer right. that somehow. Um, I would say hmm, the first step would be to assess your resources. How much information do you have on this real historical character? And what can you do with those resources? So, for example, um, one of the very first, hmm, I'll a better example, uh, we work with a gentleman named Bill Barker, and he's been playing Thomas Jefferson for about 35 years now. He's basically become Thomas Jefferson. And when he goes to the grocery store, they say, hello, Mr. Jefferson, um, because he's been doing it so long. Um, but Thomas Jefferson has written a lot. And so he's able to draw from all of Thomas Jefferson's papers and journals and um, sources of the time. Now, to compare that to Mary Pickersgill, the woman who sewed the Star Spangled Banner, we have very little information on her. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information on most women from history because, well, the history was written by men. Um, that's changing. Uh, but the only thing I could find or that I knew about Mary Pickersgill was, you know, the status of her family, how many, how many kids she had, and she had one daughter, two nieces, and an indentured servant, um, which is different from a slave. And so that was a conversation that was really interesting. Um, what is the difference between an enslaved person and an indentured servant? Um, but this person was with her for uh, just seven years, and she was learning the skills of sewing. So I knew that, and I had all of the receipts from um, the sale of this large, large flag. So I knew who ordered the flag, um, I knew how much it cost, and then I had to do some research to find out, well, how much money is that really? Like, was that a lot of money for her, or wasn't it? Um, we know where she lived. That's about it. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of information. So I had a lot of flexibility to um, determine what kind of person she might have been. And I also have to keep in mind what, um, what the decorum of the time was. Um, throughout time, the way that people are supposed to act um, has changed, um, particularly for women. Um, we've always been told how we're supposed to act. So um, I always like to identify how a woman was supposed to act in a particular time period and then twist it a little bit just a little bit to make her um, a, a little bit more revolutionary, but not too revolutionary. Um, 
So that's sort of about like how much information you have. Um, and uh, I find that I prefer to use composite characters because then I have more control over the character um, as opposed to having to stick to the facts um, of a particular person's life. So if you have a lot of information about that person, maybe you have enough material to go on. And once again, the, the folks who are doing performances for National History Day, um, it's only 10 minutes. So uh, that's totally doable. For me, I've got about 90 minutes of content for each show. And so I pull from that depending upon what the audience uh, is interested in, in hearing about. Um, but I also like the theme of it takes a lot of ordinary people to make an extraordinary difference that um, There's been this pattern in teaching history where we lift up the heroes and we talk about the people who were famous in history the celebrities of history I'll call them um, but behind those people were just tons and tons of other people who were supporting the movements, who were supporting the cause, who were supporting the leaders. And um, chances are, whoever I'm talking to in the museum, they're probably not an American hero. They're probably an ordinary person. So how can we find the things that we can do as ordinary people to make us part of the collective American hero? So that's... I hope that answered your question, but it really depends upon how much information you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So we're getting a couple of questions from people who are interested in doing the individual performances rather than group, which is mm -hmm. great for Julie because Julie almost always is just by herself, the only character. So one of those questions is how can you make it still dynamic when you're the only person up there and how might you be able to use the fourth wall um, if it's just you? Sure. Um, I would say, and I don't want to make this a blanket statement, but I would say that if you are doing a one person show, that you should probably lean towards direct address instead of a dramatized event. Um, because if there's no one to talk to, there's nothing engaging happening right here. It's more engaging if you're talking to the audience directly. Um, so how to make it more dynamic. Okay. Let's see here. How can I take everything that I teach in my acting class for 30 <laughs> hours and distill it down into 30 seconds? Um, I would say this is the key. I might change my mind later, but um, <laughs> everything that we say is every line of dialogue that comes out of our mouth is a response to something. We are responding to what another person said to us, which can't be the case in a solo piece. Um, we might be responding to something that we see, that we hear, that we taste, touch, or smell. We're responding to a stimulus. Now, uh, you might not have a whole lot of stimulus uh, if you are one person, but you can imagine that stimulus. Um, in addition to external stimulus, there's internal stimulus, and that's your thoughts, your memories, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your nightmares, the things that are inside your head. So I would say that uh, if you are performing by yourself and you don't have the benefit of interaction with other people, there's the interaction with the thoughts in your head. Ooh, I have an idea, right? So that you give yourself the thought, ah, here's what else is happening, right? If you're storytelling, it can be dynamic because you have a beginning, a middle and an end and you're telling what happened. Um, but keep in mind that everything that you say, you're saying for a reason. You're saying it in response to something, that internal or external stimulus. Another thing to keep in mind, uh, another way to make it dynamic would be to identify your objective. So what is it that you want? Do you want to educate this audience? Do you want to inspire this audience? You wanna tell this audience a secret, right? What is it that you're trying to do with each line of dialogue? And that's gonna help you put action to it. If it's an active verb, to educate, to inspire, to tell a secret, then it's going to be active. And then also keeping it dynamic, um, I would say find the variety in your instrument. And that includes your voice and your body. So what else can you do with your voice and your body? Can you change your pitch to reveal your subtext, what you really mean under what you're saying? Um, and how can you use the space? So to recap, um, everything you say is a response to a stimulus. So create that stimulus. You need an objective. What is it that you're trying to do that makes it active? And find uh, the variety or expand your range of expression with both your voice and your body. 
and um, there it is. <laughs> so to go along with that, um, a couple of people uh, wonder if doing multiple characters as an individual performance um, would be a strength, might be a distraction, and how you might do that really strongly. I, do, my do, first, do you mean if one actor plays multiple characters? Yes. Ah. I would say this is gonna take a lot of technical rehearsal, which can be very fun. Um, what is that play, Fiona? It's something tuna, greater tuna? I don't know that. Greater tuna? There's a whole series of plays, and it's like the American tuna, greater tuna, but it's always, I believe, two actors, and they mm -hmm. play the roles of the entire town. Um, so if you have access to one of those, you can look it up. Um, but uh, I would say find something really simple. If you are playing multiple characters, Find something really simple to communicate that you're changing characters, whether it's a hat, a scarf, uh, the way that you hold your body, um, something very simple that you can easily put on or take off. Mm -hmm. um, but don't let the changing of costume um, get in the way of delivering the message, you know? Um, and sometimes it takes a lot of um, rehearsal to be able mm -hmm. to do. Um, you know, I was in yeah. a play once where I was just kept spinning around and around and around. And as I spun, I changed from one character to another because there was other cast members who right. were on the edges and they were pulling pieces of my costume off and then finally the wig comes off and I'm the other character. Right. That took a lot of work. Um, right. I think so, also it's important to think about the tone of your piece. You know, every play I've been in with like quick costume changes like that, it's been a comedic play. It's been very funny. It's been worked into the comedy. Um, so if it's not a lighthearted performance you're doing, you know, think about making sure that the switches are very, you know, contained right. and and don't distract. Um, but you can kind of get a feel for it based on Absolutely. what you're doing. That's a great point. What is the tone of your piece? Yeah, mm -hmm. because costume changes can be funny. They can also be really poignant um, mm -hmm. that you, you know, okay, whenever I put this hat on, you know, is when I'm going yeah. back in time to be this right. person. Right. And I can take the hat off to be myself kind of giving some interpretation about the moment yeah. and then on the character again. Yeah. But something clean, clear, and visual to uh, help the audience understand who you are in that moment. Absolutely. Cool. Um, okay, so someone asked if, um, since we have this 10 minute limit in mind, do we write with that in mind or do we write the script and then cut lines? I think I know your answer. Ooh. <laughs> Um, okay, I've got two parts. Um, one, I'd say write it all out. Get it all down on paper. Just like my very first piece of advice was take notes, right? Because it's a lot easier to cut than it is to add. Um, that being said, whatever your final piece is that you are going to submit for National History Day, this is my advice, don't make it longer than nine minutes. Um, that, because uh, you don't want to have the stress of trying to get it all in before the time runs out because that's not where you want your focus to be. You want your focus to be on really embodying the character in telling the story and allowing yourself to breathe. One of the things that happens when you get on stage, if you're nervous is you get tense and your heart starts beating faster and your breath starts becoming shallow. And when your breath is shallow, you can't support your instrument. It's a lot harder to support your, the power of your sound. And so then you get really small and you start talking really fast and people can't hear you. They can't understand you. So my suggestion, this is my suggestion, um, is to aim to make your piece no more than nine minutes so that when you do tell it, you can elongate your vowels. You can fill the space, whatever that happens to be, a classroom or an auditorium. You can fill the space with the sound of your voice and make it vibrate instead of trying to rush until the end so that nobody cuts you off. So write a lot and then you have to understand that sometimes you need to cut and slash your best work. Um, but what you have left will be your best work. Um, so write it all down but uh keep it short enough that you don't feel like you're rushing nice someone asked uh how do you grab a viewer's attention quickly when you start a performance ah Whew. julie's really good at this that's why i asked her <laughs> it's not a simple answer um well for, for those of you who haven't been to the national museum of american history 
uh, we can get incredibly busy. It can get very chaotic. We've got field trips, we've got different groups, we've got kids running around, we've got people who are trying to understand the signs because they're international visitors and they, where's the bathroom, where's the cafeteria? I mean, it's, it's really, really busy. Um, so part of what I do is I, call, I do what's called building a crowd. And this isn't, I'll just say, this isn't really uh, applicable to National History Day, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, but I start off with eye contact. I just make contact and see if they look at me back. And if, if they do, then maybe I say, hello. And it, I just sort of build on that interaction until that person and I are having a conversation. And then their family comes over and I'm having a conversation with them. And then more people come and I invite them, oh, come and join us. I give them permission, oh, come and join us. Oh, this is really interesting, come and join us. Until I have a small crowd. And at that point, that's when I start the show. And when the crowd's big enough, I reach around, turn on my microphone, everyone can hear it, and the crowd comes. Um, so it's, um, it's a little bit like air traffic control uh, in, in building that crowd, but it starts with uh, a small, intimate connection and a bold offer. You know, you ma'am, do you pay taxes? <laughs> do you obey laws? <laughs> um, at that point, they, I've already got their attention. So, um, but I don't think that while it is a skill that is absolutely necessary for my job, I, I don't think it's a skill that's necessary for National History Day because your audience is already there. They already want you to rock the house, <laughs> right? They want you to be amazing. You've got their attention. Um, and that is, is truly a gift. The challenge is keeping their attention. So okay. they're not allowed to leave. <laughs> So we don't have much time left, and there's one last question I want us to try to give some sort of answer to, um, although it's a bigger question, and we are certainly not the end-all, be-all to this question. Um, the question is from Ruby, what do you do if you're interested in a sensitive top topic, such as Black rights, Native American history, or Jewish history? If you're not from one of these backgrounds uh, or identities, how do you perform that topic without offending? Which is a great mm. question, because it's very important that we tell lots of histories, right? And we tell lots of stories, especially in our nation, most of our history is white male history, right? Um, so we can give you at least one example of how we've done that. Um, and I can try to think of, of other thoughts, but Julie, do you wanna explain maybe justice must be done a little bit? Ah, or, yes. or do you have another answer? No, that's, um, that's great. Uh, so we have a program called Justice Must Be Done, and um, it's uh, about the anti-slavery movement. And um, at the time, we had one actor on staff, me. Um, so uh, obviously, um, I'm not able to play any of the you know, um, heroes of the anti-slavery movement I, I can't play Harriet Tubman. I can't play Frederick Douglass. Um, but uh, I can play someone who uh, contributed to the movement. And her name was Lucy Caldwell. And so um, it was a very, very difficult show to write. It was very emotional having to do the research um, and reading the stories of um, you know, people, whether they were enslaved people, free people, um, you know, is it was really a, an exercise in empathy. Um, so ultimately what I had to do was make sure that the message of my show wasn't, um, here's, here's uh, some information about these people, but rather the theme of uh, progress happens when privileged people help. And the idea that Lucy Caldwell was a middle-class white woman living in Massachusetts. And while she herself did not topple the institution of slavery, the little things that she did and the organizations that she ran contributed to the problem. Because that is a pattern that we see when it comes to giving people equal rights. It's usually because the people in power and the people with privilege make a choice to help those who do not have equal rights. Um, it hap that's when it happens. And we can feel it happening right now. Um, we can feel it that people are, are, are waking up right now in 2020. Some people have been awake for a very long time, but um, a lot of people are being like, wait a minute, I need 
as a as a white person, I need to do something to support this movement. Um, so that was the theme that I took that no matter who you are, no matter what problem, complicated problem you're trying to solve, um, you have the use whatever power you have, even as you know, she's a powerless woman in 1840, women couldn't even vote. Like what could she possibly do? She felt powerless, but she was able to organize other women and do fundraisers for the, for the, uh, this big complicated problem of slavery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say maybe shift the message. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it's important to remember that performance doesn't necessarily even have to be characters. Like if you have a topic you want to talk about and you can't really be a character in that story, you could create performance that is still artistic performancey without playing a, a person. Right. Yeah. Um, you can still so that tell might the be the story. way to go. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we are actually at three o'clock. I don't, I don't know if you have a moment, Julie, to give final remarks, um, if we have time, Lynn. Do I have time for final remarks? <laughs> Absolutely, go ahead. Great. Okay. Any final so um, as you're going through this process of uh, deciding, developing, writing, rehearsing, and performing your project for National History Day, I think it's really important for you to pay attention to how you are feeling during the process. What part of this process got you jazzed? What part of it got you excited? What part of it got your blood really pumping? Um, was it the research? Was it the development and figuring out the structure of this play? Was it the writing and the words and the language? Was it the rehearsal with your peers, building the set or the props or the costume? Was it the performance, the acting, the traveling to the different competitions, the act of competition, the social connections, the museum atmosphere, which part of that gets you excited? Um, because theater really is all subjects wrapped into one. It is not only acting and dance and design, it's history, it's math, it's physics, it's science, it's psychology, it's all of these things. So theater is a great way to get a sampling of all the things in life that you might be excited about. And uh, so the way that you're feeling in this process might tell you a lot about uh, what direction you might be taking in your adult life, because this is just one step on your very, very long, long journey of life. And uh, every step, uh, hopefully, will be as fun and enjoyable and rewarding as possible. Excellent. Well. I'll step in at that point because that's a great way to end and wrap our hour. Thank you so much, Fiona Marr, Julie Garner, from the, and the team at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. I know you've given our performance students here lots of things to think about. We'll go through the Q&A roster. If we missed a question, we'll try to get back to you in on email later today or tomorrow. Uh, we'll also send an email out to everybody. So if you missed it or maybe came a little late, you'll get a link with not only additional resources from the Smithsonian, that'll come tomorrow. It comes 24 hours after the start of the program. Um, and we'll also send a link to the recording because maybe you might wanna share this with friends, colleagues, other teachers, or along your, with our, our state coordinators. So at that point, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Happy History Day, and we'll be in touch, and we'll see you. Uh, actually, we're going to be online tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be talking about the writing process with an NHD teacher and coordinator who wrote the book, When the Akimotos Went to War. So check that out. We'll be on live tomorrow, and have a wonderful day.